The following is a reflection on the readings for Thursday of the second week of Ordinary Time. The first reading is taken from Hebrews chapter 7 verses 25 to chapter 8 verse 6. The responsorial is Psalm 40 and the Gospel is Mark chapter 3 verses 7 to 12. Sometimes when we view the world at large and see the ever-growing problems with the increase in secularism, crime, terrorism, and moral decline, and of course a pandemic, we can get discouraged. Then, when we turn to the church, perhaps things don't get a whole lot better, especially in recent years with the decline in the priesthood, the scandals, and the decreasing numbers of laity who participate in the sacraments. Finally, when we examine our own lives, the things we still struggle with, whether an addiction or some weakness that has not been overcome, or perhaps something in the past that still haunts or troubles us, and things we regret doing, this as well can leave us feeling low. So thank God for today's first reading from the letter to the Hebrews, because it reminds us of a tremendous truth that should give us great hope. That is, that Jesus Christ is our advocate, the mediator between God and us. As our high priest, he always lives to intercede for us before the Father. The Old Testament high priest went before God once a year on the Day of Atonement to plead for the forgiveness of the nation's sins. Christ, on the other hand, makes perpetual intercession before God on our behalf. So we need not fear, no matter how bad things get, nor be discouraged. Rather, we should be emboldened, like the psalmist who declares, quote, Here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. For as St. Paul says, if Christ is for us, who can be against us? Or, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And, we can add, from Hebrews, who intercedes for us. There is another consequence of Jesus' perpetual priesthood and intercession. It means that we never pray alone. Our prayers are always joined with Christ and so take on an infinite value. When we pray for someone else, we pray with Christ, united to his heart and desire. Again, this should give us confidence, should spur us on to make prayer a priority in our lives. Whenever we are tempted to get discouraged because everything is falling apart around us, let us remember that Jesus always lives to intercede for us, so that when we turn to him, open our hearts, there is healing, forgiveness, and peace. Let this be the cornerstone of our hope, so that we can say with the psalmist, quote, I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. See, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, Lord. May all who meet you rejoice and be glad in you, May those who love your salvation constantly say, Great is the Lord. End of quote. In today's gospel, Jesus is still ministering in the northern region of Galilee, and great crowds begin to follow him because of his words and deeds, and they come from all quarters, even outside Israel, from Gentile territories. So great are the numbers that Jesus tells his disciples to have a boat ready for him so that the crowd will not crush him. This preliminary statement indicates that with the increasing needs of the people, Jesus will soon call forth disciples to assist in ministry. Indeed, the very next passage in Mark's Gospel is the calling of the Twelve Apostles. A boat is often used in early Christianity as a symbol of the church. Indeed, the word nave, which describes the central part of a church, and the main area for lay worshippers and the place where baptisms are celebrated comes from the word navis, the Latin word for church. This symbolism likely emerged from the account of the ark saving Noah's family during the flood. We see it as early as 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, in which our first pope referred to the patience of God who, quote, waited in the days of Noah during the building of the ark in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water." End of quote. 
Here Peter is referring to baptism that saves us, quote, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, end of quote. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. We who have been baptized into Christ and his church and who benefit from our high priest Jesus Christ's intercession are now called to share what we first received and continue to receive, that is, the love of God through our gifts, charisms, and prayers. Finally, Jesus in today's gospel commands the unclean spirits who are being exercised not to make him known. Their cry, You are the Son of God, is an acknowledgment that the kingdom of God is being established and the prophecy of Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 is being fulfilled. We are therefore encouraged once again by our readings that despite the difficult circumstances presently facing our world, whether from natural causes or evil intent, the battle has been won and we are victorious in Christ Jesus. As today's gospel acclamation declares, quote, our Savior Jesus Christ destroyed death and brought life immortal through the gospel. End of quote. Today is also the memorial of St. Agnes, celebrated in the church as early as the 4th century. What is remarkable is that, at the tender age of 12, this young girl faced the powers at B to renounce her faith and her pledge of virginity as a bride of Christ. Several would-be suitors, enamored by her great beauty, pursued her for marriage, and when she refused, reported her to the Roman authorities under the emperor Diocletian. In the 4th century, St. Ambrose, commenting on this saint, declared, quote, Today is the birthday of a virgin. Let us imitate her piety. It is the birthday of a martyr. Let us offer ourselves in sacrifice. It is the birthday of St. Agnes who suffered martyrdom at the age of twelve. The cruelty that did not spare her youth shows all the more clearly the power of faith in finding one so young to bear it witness. There was little or no room in that small body for a wound. Though she could scarcely receive the blow, she could rise superior to it. She offers her whole body to be put to the sword by fierce soldiers. She is too young to know of death, yet is ready to face it. Dragged against her will to the altars, she stretches out her hands to the Lord in the midst of the flames, making the triumphant sign of Christ the victor on the altars of sacrilege. She puts her neck and hands in iron chains, but no chain can hold fast her tiny limbs. A new kind of martyrdom, too young to be punished, yet old enough for a martyr's crown, Unfitted for the contest, yet effortless in victory, she shows herself a master in valor despite the handicap of youth. As a bride, she would not be hastening to join her husband with the same joy she shows as a virgin on her way to punishment, crowned not with flowers, but with holiness of life, adorned not with braided hair, but with Christ himself. In the midst of tears, she sheds no tears herself, the crowds marvel at her recklessness in throwing away her life untasted, as if she had already lived life to the full. All are amazed that one not yet of legal age can give her testimony to God. So she succeeds in convincing others of her testimony about God, though her testimony in human affairs could not yet be accepted. What is beyond the power of nature, they argue, must come from its creator. What menaces there were from the executioner to frighten her, what promises made to win her over, what influential people desired her in marriage. She answered, I will be his who first chose me for himself. Executioner, why do you delay? If eyes that do not want can desire this body, then let it perish. She stood still, she prayed, she offered her neck. You could see fear in the eyes of the executioner, as if he were the one condemned. His right hand trembled, his face grew pale as he saw the girl's peril, while she had no fear for herself. One victim, but twin martyrdom, to modesty and to religion. 
Agnes preserved her virginity and gained a martyr's crown. End of quote. Let us pray. Almighty ever-living God, who chose what is weak in the world to confound the strong, mercifully grant that we, who celebrate the heavenly birthday of your martyr, St. Agnes, may follow her constancy in the faith. To our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God for ever and ever. Amen.